Let's let me know in the chat. Anyone here from uh, my last tour? From village to world capital. I'll show you the rest of Berlin now, but if you're there, let me know. Send me a wave. Hello, hello. Hi, Kristen Curry. How are you, sir? Or is it a... How are you, madam? Where are you, Kristen? Let me guess. Finishing up a coffee in... Vancouver. New York City. So, brunching. Mother's Day brunch. Yes, I did press, uh, I selected the event. Hi Teague, welcome from Canada. And from, uh, and Mark, Mark T. Holmes from uh, Salem. Well, that's uh, named after uh, a place that plays a crucial role in our Jewish history tour. Ah, Bargosh and back, good to see you again. Yeah, bar, no problem. Uh, you ask for whatever you want and I'll do it for you. Or I could restart. See where we are, look, we're right in the heart of old Berlin. Hi, Diana from California. Got a bit of Californian weather here. If you saw me last time, Barra will remember this. I was wearing a raincoat. It pulled the rain after I'd finished. It was like six degrees C. I think that was a week ago. Now, it's 80 degrees Fahrenheit at the moment. It's 29 degrees uh, centigrade. Absolutely crazy. That's why I've got the hat on and the summer shirt's back. So it's a whole new beginning. So we'll be starting, starting at the top of the hour. What you folks might want to do is, if you know other people who uh, want to share a quick tour of uh, Berlin for an hour, then uh, send them a message, get them to share or share it with them now. And please, uh, it helps us out. Don't forget to like and, uh, and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Give us a thumbs up. Teague, never come to Berlin. It's strange. I, I hear that quite a lot. Uh, those, most people, you know, when they come to Europe, they want to go to kind of the blue sky circuit, which I can understand. Italy, Spain, Greece. A lot of people gone down to southern Germany. Never been that easy to, uh, to get to Berlin. It's not really on the way anywhere. You know what I mean? In fact, if I turned around and went towards that church that I'll tell you about shortly, one of Berlin's oldest surviving buildings, um, in 60 miles in a straight line, I'll be in Poland. So those who are on that kind of route might come through Berlin, or if they're heading up to the Baltic. But it's uh, kind of in the wrong place, which is important if you were on my tour before. Berlin's position's kind of strange, and also important for this uh, Jewish history tour as well. Thanks for sharing, Diana Garrity. Hi, Palmyra. Nice way from you. Where are you watching from, Palmyra? I went to Palmyra or Palmyra in Syria a lot when I used to be an archaeologist. Amazing place now, tragically. 
even more ruinous than it was uh, before the conflict in Syria. Beautiful, amazing place. In fact, next time you're traveling in Europe, go online, have a look at some of the pictures of the ruins of Palmyra, and you'll notice how they were copied in a lot of European classical style buildings in this town. And uh, most European cities became really very fashionable end of the 1700s, early 1800s, Palmyrene style. Good name. So share, like, subscribe. We're going to go uh, start the tour officially at the uh, top of the hour, so in about five minutes. Let me just show you here where I am. We'll do a little bit of a zoom around. We're in the heart of Berlin. It's boiling hot. You get a lot of people out. It's kind of a weird feeling in Berlin uh, today. I think people have kind of a bit of cabin fever. It's the oldest part of Berlin, even though it doesn't really look like it. And there's a perfect image of the past and the future. And that future, of course, lasted for Nikki Olroyd from Edinburgh. I remember you. Welcome back. Great to see you again. Like and subscribe and share to the rest of uh, Scotland. Congrats on your elections results, if that's something you agree with. That's the communist TV tower from 1969, built to show that communism was modern. And here in 1989, just below that, past those trees, is where the demonstrations in 1989 took place to change the world. So the oldest part of Berlin is where we're going to start because the story of Jewish history in Berlin is as old as the town itself. Anybody else in the house? Give me a wave. Can you hear me okay? That's important. Because we're going into a slightly more kind of built up area, so you need to let me know. Can you hear me now? And uh, if I start to get a little bit broken up, reception should be good. But you need to let me know that as well. Any questions before we start Jewish history? In Berlin? I mean, you could probably imagine what most people think we're going to be focusing on. Thank you, Diana. But it's a broader story. Thank you, Bart. Good to hear. Kind of amazing when you think that uh, we can actually do this. Thank you, Palmyra. Michaela D from Curl on his back. Guten Abend to you. It's funny, I think, what is it? Uh, midday on the East Coast, and here it's beer o'clock. But it's great we can all get together and uh, share some time uh, in Berlin. Very interesting uh, story I've got to tell you today. And uh, important, very relevant as well. Arizona, Jill Smith. Bellis, thank you. Welcome. Uh, give us a like, give us a subscribe, share it with the rest of your team. We're going to be starting in a couple of minutes. Michaela D can't have a beer until, uh, <laughs> until you get permission. <laughs> Probably wise, but if you're celebrating Mother's Day with your mother, that's always good. Always freaks me out, right? Because I'm originally from England and uh, We've already had Mother's Day, so every time I see these alerts, it's Mother's Day, you get a bit of a heart attack. Jody Tucker, yes we are. We will be going through the Scheunenviertel, the barn, or perhaps sometimes you see it translated as shed quarter. That lies behind those spectacular East German buildings there. So we'll, have to be, wander we'll be wandering through. Marcelo or Marcello from Argentina, good. Buenos dias to you. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a like so that other people can join as well. The bells are ringing and any minute now I shall be starting. I'm just going to have a little uh, pause which aids our editing uh, um, and our moderator. But any minute now. It's nice that you guys are actually meeting people you know from the tour on the tour. That's fantastic. That's a great feeling. Bringing people together. 
That's what these tours are all about. Okay, any minute now we're gonna start. So sit back and relax. Still time to like and subscribe and there is still time to share in uh, anyone else you think might want to join us. But we're gonna begin, I'm just gonna count down and then we're gonna start. Hey everybody, welcome back to Berlin. Welcome back to Sandman's live broadcast. My name is Nick Jackson. I am from Virtual Berlin Tours and Jackson's Berlin Tours. And I'm back to give you another tour. And today's tour is going to be about Jewish history uh, in Berlin. Um, we've already seen from the comments from folks who've uh, um, joined before. It's a very popular uh, uh, and interesting theme. It's very relevant today. But what I'm gonna tell you is a story that you might feel perhaps longer um, than you assumed because as long as there's been a town called Berlin, there's been a Jewish community uh, within it. So we're gonna start at the beginning, which is why, and I'll show you around in a minute, why I am standing here. It's a longer story than people think. Um, it's a story with flashes of brilliance, um, but of course it's always, and rightly, overshadowed by the tragedy uh, of the Holocaust and the just repulsive brutality uh, of the Nazi regime. And of course, no Jewish history tour would be complete without uh, covering that. Um, so sit back and relax, and I'm gonna show you around. Let's just have a look first uh, at where we are. Those are on my tour before. I gave you a little idea about where Berlin began. You would have heard that I was on an archeological excavation uh, recently, not that far from here, not really much to see um, from where we are now. Obviously there's a limit to how far I can travel, but let me just change the camera. Because I mentioned Berlin was born as a village. And if you cast your minds back to um, 1234, you can see here in the distance, the spire of St. Nicholas's church. It was one of three in what was a young town. It was probably about 100 years old. That's 100 years older than people thought until recently. Because gone now, just over here behind these buildings was the spire of St. Peter's Church, and that's where I was excavating. Split by the river, St. Nicholas, the patron saint of merchants. But around here, the reasons we're gonna start here, poking up above the trees and spring has arrived with a vengeance is St. Mary's Church from the 1270s. So imagine where we're standing now as a marketplace, eventually with cemetery outside uh, the church. And all around here, we have been crowded medieval buildings. And as you can see, there's very uh, little of that medieval town left. It was modernization. It was the damage of the war. And here you can see the inspirational TV tower from 1969. All of this area was demolished and um, the heart of communist East Berlin was built here. Um, and 40 years later, it will be here where the communist East German experiment um, collapsed. So a really poignant place. It changed the world, but we're gonna cast our minds back to the beginning. Here is Museum Island, the river, and these two little medieval towns. Um, because right from the beginning, let's say the beginning of the 1200s, there was a Jewish community within this town. So one of the questions you might have is, if Berlin is in the middle of nowhere, why would, in Northeastern Europe, elements of the European Jewish diaspora, diaspora is a Greek word for scattered, so a scattered population, why would they end up here? And that is a very good question, and that is where we are going to begin. Now, um, I spend a lot of time actually in the Holy Land proper. Um, one of my great passions and one of the great uh, um, bonuses of my life is I get to travel and study the archaeology uh, of the Old Testament uh, area itself. But I'm sure you're aware that during the time of the emperor or the man who would become Emperor Vespasian, um, in the 70s AD, so just under 2,000 uh, odd years ago, um, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed and the Jewish community um, would start to spread um, all over Europe. They'd move over North Africa and into Spain, into Western France, the so-called Sephardim, Western European Jewish communities. And others would follow the place where they could survive, and that would be into Central Europe, specifically for Germany along the Rhine, where towns would eventually grow up after the Roman conquest, where generally uh, Roman camps were situated. So for the very early period, shall we say, um, 
500, 600, 700, 800 uh, AD, 900 AD. There were, the towns were Frankfurt, Worms, Mainz, down on the Rhine. Uh, and it would be there, in a way, that after the um, destruction of the temple and the beginning of the, uh, the diaspora, that um, the great centers of Jewish learning and culture um, uh, would um, survive uh, in a place, the uh, traditional Holy Land, where, of course, um, they'd been uprooted. So the question is, how do you get from um, the Rhine River um, to a place that the Romans never arrived at, hundreds of miles beyond the influence of the classical world? And I just wanted to tell you that story briefly, because you would know it, I suspect, as the Crusades. Starting in the late 1000, so 1099, Jerusalem would be taken by the Crusades. The horrendous brutality of hordes of thousands of armed people with their retainers, women, children, following behind these huge movements of people down through Central Europe um, would, um, shall we say, upgrade uh, um, persecution against these established Jewish communities uh, along the Rhine River and elsewhere. Um, so people will get pushed further um, east into what's now Poland and up uh, into this area. There were already um, uh, elements of trade that those, those Jewish communities um, might well have been interested in. But the Crusades is what pushes people further east, and certainly by 1200, 1240, there would have been a Jewish community living within this town. And I wanted to show you where that would have been. Just over here, poking through the trees, you can see what is Berlin's town hall. And in a town that's had such a, a tumultuous last century of history, um, a place where all the road names have changed. Just think, there were the um, pre-war, pre-World War One road names. Then they would have had the um, democratic years of the 20s. Then you've got the Nazis who changed the names of the roads. Then East Germany changes the names of the roads. Now modern Berlin has changed the names of the roads. On the left-hand side of this building is the beginning of a street called Judenstrasse, Jewish Street. And um, just beyond that, um, on the other side of what is now a sort of a wide motorway built in the 1930s during the Nazi period, was a place called the Judenhof, the Jewish court. Uh, it was a set of houses that backed onto each other, and the Judenstrasse, and we're talking now the 12th and the 13th centuries, um, would have come through here, and we'll be um, walking along an area that would have been an extension to that road to what would have been the town wall, where there probably would have been a place for them to bury the dead. We'll be moving there um, uh, um, in just one second. But we need to remember that that community, not just here, but elsewhere, all over Europe, in, shall we say, um, the 1200s, 1300s, was always under pressure. But the great story of the Jewish communities within Europe is that under that pressure, they still managed to flourish. They still managed to make, if they can, their lives tolerable. And our story um, is elements of these flashes of brilliance as they make this brilliant contribution, um, certainly uh, within Berlin over the next few centuries, but we need to bear in mind that pressure um, is always there. Um, in the middle of the 1300s, the community here was expelled, and the reason for that was uh, plague. And we're just going to set up something which tragically, the echoes of which you can hear from the centuries after that, um, and that um, even in the Nazi period and tragically, uh, dangerously even today. Um, when um, a people who are essentially 700 years ago illiterate, they haven't got the information that we have now, when they become afraid, they start to look for people to blame. So an episode of plague here in the middle of the 13th century, um, as they felt that that plague, the local population, was some sort of divine retribution, the Jewish community were blamed, um, they were put under huge pressure, people, uh, um, uh, there are, uh, under this pressure, um, apparently, you know, some confess to poisoning the wells. That is one of the reasons the community here were booted out. And for a hundred years, um, they were um, not permitted to live within the environs of uh, Berlin. But they're allowed back, and in the 1500s, um, there is a, another um, uh, period of expulsion, and that has to do with a man who stands just over here. And, uh, I'm going to ask you, I'll show you a picture of him, or a statue of him that's just reappeared, and you can tell me whether or not you know this man's name. So outside St Mary's Church, here on the ground these red lines mark where the houses used to be. Anyone know the name of this guy? famous. 
Our man's name is Martin Luther. Now Martin Luther's Reformation in 1517 would change the Christian world forever, but um, having started acknowledging, of course, um, that uh, Jesus Christ was born uh, um, a first century Jew, Martin Luther, Alex, Alexei, you got that right, um, his Reformation, he would think, would offer final salvation and the grace of, uh, of Jesus or Christian uh, grace to Jewish communities. But as we know for centuries, in fact for millennia, um, simply wanting to do their own thing and uh, live their own lives, um, the, um, the turn of Martin Luther against Jewish communities who refused to um, accept his new reformed church um, would um, call, um, cause that man to write the most horrendous um, uh, pamphlets calling for people to be killed, calling for synagogues to be burned, um, uh, things that the Nazi regime would use to justify their brutal um, persecution uh, later as well. So by the 1570s the community were expelled, but in the middle of the 1600s the European world changed and Jewish communities were invited back and it would be that 1670-1671 community and their descendants that would put Berlin on the map as a brilliant uh, um, uh, centre of um, Jewish cultural life um, eradicated then later during the horrors of the 20th century. And I'm just going to set it up because you can see where I used to live. Just over here used to be a house just where I'm on the curb where this bus is parked and in there lived a man that was called the Jewish Socrates and that man's name was Moses Mendelssohn and we'll be thinking about him as we move um, through the city. So the community under pressure always by the 1600s um, some uh, families uh, start to arrive and they were called protected Jews. Now protected Jews it sounds like the state were protecting them but the realities of course were um, that you would pay to come, pay for this protected status, and you would also uh, have to pay uh, to leave. So we'll think about the details of that 1600s um, Jewish community in just a minute. Let me just get over the road here. Now I can see a lot of questions coming up. Oh look here, look, you can see the little red man. That's the eastern traffic light little person on the other side of the road up there. This is the Heideroy to Gasser. It would have been an extension of the Judengasser or the Jewish alley or Ju uh, Judenstrasse. And just at the end of it, as we come into this street, we're going to see where the medieval wall used to be. So we're right on the limits. The community where they actually lived was essentially on the northeastern side of the city, up against the wall, one of the poorest, most dangerous parts of a city and this street would have taken them to the other side where a gate called the Spandauer Gate would have been just down at the end of this road to the left. Now, if those who have been to Berlin before might well have come to this area if you're interested in this history, and I've chosen this route, can't keep it entirely chronological. I wanted to show you something special because I wanted to focus on, for the modern period, two little pinpricks of light in a massive darkness, two little positive elements that remember the brilliant contribution that the Jewish community make um, uh, and also some two little stories that raise questions um, as to the local population's behaviour during World War II. And this is the Rosenstrasse, as it used to be called. And there are two reasons why we're going to come here. Um, over here in 1714, in the corner, under Frederick the Great's father, the so-called Soldier King, King Friedrich Wilhelm I of Prussia, the first state-sanctioned synagogue was constructed. Um, and it was here in 1943 that for uh, um, a week and a half um, there was a protest against deportation of the Jews. Most people come, as, as we will, look at this and its iconography. It was created by a woman called Ingeborg Hunziger. It was put up in the 1990s. It was one of the later works, and it commemorates the um, only recorded public protest against uh, deportations in Berlin, February of 1943. But what most people don't look at, which I think is very interesting, is this bit. Now, if you look here, as we look at the faces, they're never particularly happy. Um, some are less 
unhappy than others. And these look relatively benign, but you can see they're not particularly happy. And you can see here, there's a tree and people sitting underneath it. Um, this lies away from the main memorial, and this is a very similar image to one of Berlin's, mo or Germany's most famous Jewish painters um, during the Enlightenment period, a man called Bendermann. Um, so I would interpret this um, as a biblical reference to the time of the exile. Um, underneath the willow trees by the rivers of Babylon, there we wept when we remembered Zion. So the burning of the temple by Nebuchadnezzar, exile in Babylon, the return for the rebuilding of the second temple, only to be burned again by the Romans. This is a reference to that period. You have a man here. So he's confined, he's hiding, but there's also a feeling of security and a feeling of prayer. And here you have a man with a broken violin. As Jewish diasporas all over the world make this great contribution to the cultural lives uh, of the uh, countries uh, in which they are guests. Um, and the broken violin, I think, um, sums up uh, adequately how that is abused in the 12 years that this was Adolf Hitler's capital. And World War II, of course, the anniversary of the end of World War II, May the 8th. So yesterday, tomorrow, if you're interested, is uh, the anniversary of the Nazi book burning stunt from 1933. So we'll look at this in detail. I'm going to start, though, around the back um, and we'll set up the story. Now I'll tell you a little bit of the details um, of the fate of the 170,000 Berlin the Jews that lived here um, as Adolf Hitler became Chancellor in 1933. Um, and the statistics work um, also for Germany as a whole. So 170,000, about 50% of those people had left. Five, 7,000 survived in hiding and were helped by um, German um, civilians and others. Um, but um, about 55,000, just under 56,000 um, 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 Jewish um, Berlin's, Berlin's were murdered during the Nazi period. By 1943, the deportation um, trains had been deporting regularly since October of 1941. But there was a group of um, uh, German men, numbering in the region of about 4,000 here, who were, um, had a mixed racial heritage and were married to German women. Now, at the beginning of 1943, the great disaster of Stalingrad took place. Um, the uh, Nazi regime um, realized that the German people were, it was dawning on them, the war was lost. So, um, Goebbels, the propagandist for the Nazi regime and the um, um, man who was in charge of the Nazi party in Berlin from the day it was formed to the day he killed himself um, above Hitler's bunker, um, he decided that he was going to arrest um, these um, uh, so-called um, privileged Jews so that he could announce that Berlin was finally uh, um, rid of its Jewish community. So on the 27th or the last week of February 1943 he had them arrested. Um, if you look at the documentation, um, it was a roundup. The German word for that would be Erfassung. Um, it was not entirely sure, 100% sure, what was going to happen to them. Uh, many of those men were brought here to what was um, the um, Jewish Community um, Organizational Building. It used to be a post office. They were locked up here, um, and generally you read that they were going to be deported to Auschwitz. Um, it's uh, possible um, that because of their, their privileged status and the Nazi sensitivity to their German wives that they were going to be taken to concentration camps um, in northern Germany. Either way, uh, neither of it was good. Of course, their wives find out um, they make um, written complaints at the main police station at Alexanderplatz where the TV tower is. They find out where their men are being held and very bravely in the freezing weather they come and face down uh, the guards um, and um, protest. The station that we're about to pass was shut down and um, so that people couldn't see the crowd. Uh, they were sometimes going away and then coming back the next day at night, but they faced down machine guns uh, and the Nazis blinked and the men were released. Um, 
Teague Neal asked, at what point did they know they had lost the war? That's a very uh, interesting question. I suspect that um, the head of the German army realised by the end of 1941 that it was 50-50, by the end of 1942 it was over. But every Friday um, reports from within the kingdom were um, presented to the Nazi elite. What were people thinking? Um, and the German people um, by 1943, after the fall of Stalingrad, had realised they'd been lied to, they were fed up with being lied to, uh, and they realised the war had turned um, because from then the Eastern Front will be coming backwards until it reached this city where it began um, in April, May of 1945. So, um, Kristen Curry, do you think they have mo uh, this intended to have the moss? No, but at the end of the day, it's an organic uh, material, it's an organic memorial, and uh, uh, as the memorial changes, you could say so does the memory. It's also very soft, it's difficult to clean. Let's have a look at it. So you have perhaps the uh, protecting hand of the Lord and these two uh, um, figures here, both women uh, mourning as they stand outside, worried about the fate of their husbands. And then a pretty graphic statement here, 1943, the year it happened. It says, the power of civil disobedience and the, power, the vigor of love or the power of love overcomes the violence of dictatorship. And here it says, women stood here defeating death and up here it says, give us our husbands back or give us our men back, which is what they shouted. And it says, Jewish men were free. So, um, a really, um, a pretty powerful uh, statement. Um, I don't think it's worth getting into the, if there'd been more of this during Nazi Germany, what the result would have been. Um, it's a uh, difficult debate because if it didn't happen, why talk about it? But at the end of the day, it's a very important uh, thing to remember that these women did stand um, and uh, take that risk um, and those uh, men, irrespective of what the final plan would have been for them after they'd been taken from this building, the former post office. Um, uh, it is a very mem uh, moving memorial, Dana, I agree. So here you can see the couples worried about the fate. Here you can see the women breaking through perhaps the barrier, the windows of the building that they're in. They're incarcerated. And here you can see the mourning women and the incarcerated men and uh, some elements of Jewish iconography. So you can have the Ethrog there, it's for the Sukkot festival, Harvest Festival, you have the Lion of Judah, the menorah, and the priestly blessing. And you can see here as well. So very powerful, the women's protest, unique, brave, and uh, a little pinpoint of light, very moving in a massive darkness. So East Germany commemorated the synagogue. There were over 20. And we're going to think about that terrible night in 1938 where most of the synagogues here were burned. It used to be called Crystal Night. Now it's called Reich Pogrom Night. Pogrom is a racially motivated murderous attack. I always wonder about this because you have the rarest interpretations. What do you think this is as this solitary individual sits on a bench? Now, on the one hand, it could be the, the small incremental um, attempts to ruin uh, Jewish Germans' lives and an encouragement for them to leave the country. You can't own a radio, you can't go to the cinema, you can only go to the post office at this time, you can only go to the bakery at that time, you can't earn jewellery, um, all those sorts of things. Um, but there's another, perhaps more sinister interpretation, because that person is watching this. Now, this story is the demonstration, but as the famous phrase, the uh, road to Auschwitz was built with hatred, but it was paved with indifference because the Jewish deportation or Jewish Berliners deportations, one of the main collection points for the march to the deportation stations, I'm going to show you uh, shortly, um, that takes place early in the morning as people are gathered and marched to stations. You ever wondered why that might be? Why would they be taken early in the morning? This is the building, the post office, originally where they were kept. So now that's the open grassy space and the memorial is just over there. And just around here we can see a picture of the freight platform at Grunewald. 
Alexa BP knows that the Bavarian Quarter in Berlin um, has a very interesting, it's true, it's a very interesting set of memorials where the street furniture, so signs and various other things, are a list of these laws um, outlawing certain elements of uh, life gradually um, through the mid uh, to late 30s. Um, and uh, um, that's a very uh, powerful place um, to go as well. Um, is this in a residential area? It's not just this, it's not just in a residential area, it is in a villa area. So it's not that densely populated because they're very expensive houses. It's where many politicians would live um, in the 1920s. Um, so it's not that dense. Um, it's there for more practical reasons in terms of accessing um, railway lines out to the um, southeast. But um, it's still there, Grunewald, uh, a very powerful uh, memorial. For me, the taking away of people early in the morning is so, of course, they're not seen by the population. Um, but then you have to ask yourself, why did they not want people to see? And the conclusion, I think you must come to there, is you don't want people to see because you know what you're doing is wrong. But as we know, it's, uh, it's still done. And we'll think about that further up here. So this area today, the Hackershire Market area we're about to walk into is one of the, certainly one of the best places to stay if you come to Berlin. It's full of little boutique shops, it's got great accommodation. Um, it's very close to funky parts of Prenzlauer Berg, bars, clubs, that sort of stuff. Um, it's very close to the historic city centre, Museum Island, just a few minutes, uh, for example. Um, in the 90s, this was an area of a lot of empty buildings. Um, this was, of course, East Berlin. And if we'd gone this way, in a few miles, we would have come to the Berlin Wall. Other side of it was West Berlin. If we'd gone that way, to the left, we would have come to the Berlin Wall and on the other side was West Berlin. So this was like a triangle of East Berlin that wasn't really going anywhere. So that meant they didn't knock down the old buildings and turn it into this. So the old buildings were still there. They were kind of broken and empty. And a lot of the squat complexes and funky venues were set up in these um, uh, old buildings, some of which, one of which still survives but the rest of it has grown up just like we've grown up and now it's a much groovier part of town, much more upmarket, some of the highest rental prices, but a great place to stay in terms of um, accommodation, restaurants, bars and fun uh, and a perfect location for your visit. So just over here on non-corona times this would be absolutely packed with folks sitting around listening to music and drinking but at the moment we've still got a couple more weeks of uh, restrictions even though Germany's uh, vaccination program is moving apace and in fact even I managed to snag one last week so I hope wherever you are uh, your vaccination programs are doing well. Get vaccinated and then we can all travel. So people are noticing, Teague noticed not many masks. I mean, when you're outside, you'll notice that nearly all the people here are relatively young. Uh, and of course, you know, there's a point, like young people feel that they're, they might get it, but it isn't gonna do them too much damage. Um, and that's probably true. The people feel outside there are certain areas, crowded streets, where it's obligatory to wear a mask, but people here, they feel as long as they're outside, they're relatively immune. Now, this is the Hackischer Hofer. It was an experimental, beginning in the 1900s, uh, complex, very modern, very Berlin, because you had businesses, offices, advertising space, and this was all built, this set of courtyards, um, to try and um, alleviate one of the big problems of disease in Berlin because this was actually the most densely populated part of town and it was also very crowded um, uh, and dark and the way the houses here had been put up in the, in the 1700s and 1800s was to maximize the amount of space that people could rent therefore um, 
um, they were very dark and airless, the courtyards, and, and hygiene was bad. So it was so prevalent, tuberculosis in Berlin, that it was actually called the Berlin disease. And I'm going to take you through here, rebuilt after World War II, and I'll show you one of the rare surviving courtyard complexes, which has now been dedicated to theatres and little venues. But it gives us a sense of what these courtyard houses used to be like. Um, the wealthier you were, the closer to the front you lived, because then you got, you know, air, light, that type of stuff. But I just wanted to introduce you to things we're going to see several of, and they are Stolpersteine. Now, these are brass stumbling stones in English. And what they do is they commemorate, um, it's a reference to a, um, a line in the Torah, um, which is, um, if, if a person's name is forgotten, uh, then their memory is, uh, is lost. So you just need to remember their names. Um, so here you have, um, there are 60,000 of them now. They were organized by a man called Gunter Demnig. He's an artist. And you'll see the names of a family called the Schneebaums. So you have, uh, difficult to see. I'm trying to get it so you don't see the glare. You've got Herman and Jenny Schneebaum. They lived at this address and this is their birth date, 1906, 1908. But I wanted to show you this because often people conflate um, Holocaust victims with other victims groups during World War II. Um, many people died. Um, why should, like in, in the Soviet Union, for example, official reports include six million murdered Jews, but just see them as um, a statistic within a larger, uh, horrendous number of dead. But often when I hear that, I think of Victor Schneebaum, because he was deported and murdered in Auschwitz, and he was born in that year and went in that one. And I don't think Victor can be blamed for anything. So we'll see more of those. Um, they're all over Germany now. They're also in Poland, the Czech Republic. Uh, they're spilling out beyond other borders, but they're very, very poignant. Uh, one name, a group of families, their relationship, their ages, and outside where they lived. Stumbling Stones, a very interesting project. And I'm going to take you into a very different courtyard now. And I hope that my feed still works, so let me know if I'm breaking up. Well, we historians, this reminds us of something else. First up, it reminds us of what this area was like, um, you know, 150 odd years ago, where people were kind of sharing apartments. One family worked during the day and the other came the night shift. Um, it's also busted, shows us what it looks like. Uh, period uh, of East Germany. Innovated recently, but I want to tell you quickly about a man who was only rediscovered really in the 1990s by an academic researcher who worked up here in these rooms. Now you can see here there's a picture of Oscar. Up here you might be able to see, if not I'll show it to you, but you can see a name Anne, that's Anne Frank up there, uh, and in here worked a man called Otto Weidt. Otto Weidt came from Rostock, he was um, a wallpaper, he, was a, um, he did wallpaper in people's apartments but he had a congenital eye disease. In the 1920s he was very active um, as a radical left winger, um, he was a social democrat all through his life and because um, he um, was uh, um, losing his he decided to open a new business. So that new business opened in two different places in Berlin. It was making brushes. Uh, and one of the reasons why you have a picture of Oscar Schindler here is that they managed to do the same thing and that save some of their Jewish workers as a result of their humanity and two other things. Um, wheeler dealing uh, and bribing and sweet talking Gestapo agents um, to help their uh, workers as well as um, 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 getting the job that they were doing um, designated as essential war work. So he opened a brush factory that, br that survived, uh, supplied brushes to the German army. But by 1941-1942 he can't stop um, businesses um, um, operating with about 30 Jewish workers, some of which were blind. Um, as word got out, as other German um, Jewish families were put under pressure, um, they heard that Weit might help them some. They all came to Berlin and Otto Weidt would help them. So as raids came, he got advance warning. He managed to buy the staff off. He had a 
desk and people would then hide. Um, at the very back of this building, he had a, uh, a windowless room with a cupboard over the front door where he hid in 1943. Um, the, the Horn family, the father of which was blind, they were eventually betrayed and deported. Um, and when it became, uh, the pressure became too much and um, his workers were being deported to Theresienstadt concentration camp in the Northern Czech Republic, he and his neighbours from a previous factory building, um, one was a doctor, one was a printer, um, they managed to organise food parcels, medical parcels to support those people in um, uh, Terezine. But um, two women stand out from the story. One is a woman called Inga Deutschkron. Um, he and her, um, she and her mother um, would be protected by Veit. He gets a fake uh, um, identity identification papers. Eventually, um, eventually, um, they were actually, the Deutschkron mother and daughter were um, kept in a house on, in Knieserbeck by some friends uh, and then aided and supported by Veit's little uh, set of helpers. Um, they survive um, uh, the war in Berlin, eventually in Potsdam. But the story of Alice Veit is even more amazing um, because Alice Veit was a um, the young member of the Veit family. He can't stop them, her family going to Terezin. Um, he manages um, just like during the factory action we thought about in 1943, um, he just closed his business. So when people came to, um, to take those um, uh, uh, Jewish workers in the same operation um, at the beginning of 1943 that would see the, um, uh, the men taken to the Rosenstrasse to come to work. But go um, they're allowed then to get let me just stop. They're allowed then to get parcels. Uh, he supports them and they have a little sort of coded message system set up. Uh, she starts to get worried because in 1944 the Licht family would be deported to Auschwitz. Now young Alice is the only one that survives that arrival. Um, Otto Weit travels to Auschwitz to find out what happened to Alice Licht. He he is, he's heard that she survives arrival and has been taken to a place called uh, Christianstadt. He then gets message to her saying, I've rented accommodation in the town. Um, if you manage to break away from here, because uh, there's going to be an evacuation surely in the next few months, this is towards the end of 1944, there's food and money and clothes for you. She manages to break away, survives, comes back and lives with Otto Veit and Mrs. Otto Veit before she heads on to New York. So again, two stories um, of Otto Veit and his, his efforts, um, his luck, his bravery. Um, and uh, though Addis Licht, Licht is no longer with us, um, Inge Deutschkorn is still alive. Um, he was given righteous amongst the nation status. So if you're ever lucky enough to get to Jerusalem and you go to Yad Vashem, you can find his marker there. So we walk through these courtyards. I want to talk in these little tunnels, perhaps. Um, I might lose a bit of coverage, but we're going to be coming out onto the Sophienstrasse and we'll pick up the story of the Jewish community who came in the 1670s. Teague wants to know, how did I meet the esteemed Chris Sanneman? That's a whole other tour. <laughs> but uh, shocking long time ago now. Up here. There's a, up here there's a billiard room, but it's two along one side of the But, have a look at this. This is the Sophienstrasse. If you're interested in literature, it's one of the most famous. It appears in the first page of the famous book, Berlin Alexanderplatz. What I'm going to be doing is heading down to a street that was called, during the East German years, they called it the Street of Tolerance. Um, before World War II, it was called the Street of the Columns. And it's very interesting with some very poignant memorials. 1670, 1671, in Vienna, um, wealthy Jewish families 
um, who were suffering the same type of pressure that Jews all over Europe were suffering at various degrees, um, which was essentially um, uh, restricted status, um, have, um, uh, over taxation, limit to the numbers of businesses that they could uh, um, open, um, and generally restriction from um, being members of the guilds. Now this thing here is the Berlin Handworker Verein, so the Berlin sort of skilled workers Verein. Um, and by the time this was opened, um, the Jewish community um, had actually um, temporarily achieved um, full status and kind of emancipation, 1815. Then it's taken away from them, then it's returned towards the end uh, of the 1800s. But this building here was essentially a union meeting place and during the fight for power, the Nazis would speak here and the communists would hold their rallies in here and now it's a rather funky uh, um, cine uh, uh, theater. Um, and you can see here a little glimpse of what this town would have looked like at the time that we're thinking about in the 1600s and the 1700s because these old buildings managed to survive. So the Jewish community in Vienna, there were 50 families, and they suffered the same kind of persecution in Berlin. For example, um, right at the very beginning, the main trades that would have been, um, could have been practiced here um, in the um, 1200s, 1300s would have been things like wood, um, uh, trade in wood, uh, various grains and wool. Um, so some of the very first mentions of Jewish communities within Berlin are restrictions that they're not allowed to operate within those businesses. So that would leave them niche uh, industries and by the 1600s um, it's things like uh, gem cutting, uh, medallion cutting, um, gold and silver, um, silk, velvet industries. In fact Moses Mendelssohn, one of the um, great minds of uh, of Berlin cultural life would work uh, and become part owner in a silk manufacturing and he's buried in the cemetery um, just around the corner. But in Vienna 50 wealthy families and their retainers were expelled and things had changed within 16th uh, uh, or 17th century Europe because there had been a great war as a result of that man Martin Luther again. So Martin Luther not, doesn't just um, spark off um, anti-semitism but he causes a war um, which eventually would last 30 years, finishing in 1648 as Protestant powers as, to which Berlin belonged and Catholic powers all over Europe battle it out. It was a dreadful time. Berlin's population had dropped to about probably less than 12,000 occupied houses. So remember our four, if you were on my first tour, our four royal family members? Um, um, the first of those, the great elector, invited Huguenots and Dutch very wealthy, powerful countries with international trade and they had skills that Berlin wanted to boost the population. But he also invited the families from Vienna to come here. And the reason for that was um, uh, that financing certainly of things like war and young ambitious states like Prussia, they were looking for some sort of finance organization that wasn't caught up in the inter-Catholic and Protestant or inter-royal family rivalries um, so that they'd have hopefully these banking families as they would become um, they'd have loyalty just to their patron rather than um, perhaps being slightly less trustworthy and being connected to other um, European royalty. So Jewish um, families were often then favoured and these families would come and open businesses uh, and from there you'd get for example the great um, um, families like the Itzigs and the Levines and the Arons, and the Ephraims, all of which um, would um, become uh, financers and organizers and officials protected by the Prussian court for the court of Prussia. So here we come on to the Grosse Hamburger Strasse. Uh, and even though there's this weird deli at the end of it, you can't buy a big hamburger on the street. Down there is where the Hamburg gate used to be. So that is Torstrasse, Gate Street. You have seven gates there. Beyond that was countryside. Now in 1670, this area hadn't been developed. What you had here were barns. You had just over 20 state barns or, or sheds. That's why this area became known as the Barn Quarter. And you got some interesting places to worship, but let's just get briefly back to our uh, story. Um, protected Jews had to pay 
to stay and the family and their firstborn, certainly by the middle of the 1700s, would have residency rights. But then you had five levels of restriction below that. So your second child, for example, would have to apply for, pay for, uh, um, and perhaps be denied um, a right to settle where his parents and um, elder brother uh, used to live. One of the most peculiar and perhaps sort of laughable and rude elements were that Jewish communities within Berlin in the 1700s had to, um, as they got married, they had to Extremer, es wird nicht aufgenommen, schon Sonntag noch. Absolutely ridiculous. But, ich wird nicht aufgenommen, es live. Keine Ahnung. Um, so they, they were given a certain amount of porcelain, depending on how wealthy they were. So they're given porcelain and then they're expected to sell it and return that money um, to the coffers. Um, so the poorest would be given 28 talers worth of porcelain. But what we're looking at here is St. Hedwig's Hospital. So this is a Catholic hospital and in there you have a Catholic place of worship one of three places of worship on the street. Yeah, I was having a chat with those locals because, you know, I could just ignore them, but they weren't going away. I was just talking to these dudes on the street because even though teenagers think that they are the super funkiest, most high-tech bros in the world, um, it hasn't seemed to dawn on them that if you're walking along live streaming, that you're not making a skateboarding video. I mean, call me old fashioned. Um, so they're always under the impression that they are being filmed and either, you know, think that they're going to be on TV um, or they start to just make silliness. I think it's because they're put under pressure. In a minute we're going to see a Protestant church. Now, that's a rather interesting little view. Let's see if we can get it without the glare. And just down here, you can see where we're going to finish. That is the synagogue. The uh, street hasn't got any uh, trees on it. That's rather interesting. Most of those were cut down at the end of the war. Um, East Germany generally didn't replant trees in these sorts of areas because, of course, they wanted uh, better to monitor people on the streets. But I just want to look down here because on this corner of this house here lived a woman called Regina Jonas. Um, so when the community came, they were um, um, relatively orthodox, um, Central Eastern European um, Ashkenazi Jews. But, um, for details I'll give you in just a sec, um, as they live and absorb the Enlightenment Prussia, they start to absorb um, elements of German and European philosophy, which produces a blend which would become known as German Jewry, or um, Reform Judaism, that is then taken from here um, later all over the world. And Regina Jonas is a good example of the product of that, because she would become the first ordained female rabbi. It's our second place of worship the Sophia Kirche, Sophie's Church, a Protestant building. So now we've seen two, Catholic and Protestant. Um, and if you look here, this is one of the places where you can see they've renovated these former clergy buildings, now private apartments. But if you look here, you can still see the bullet scars from the Battle of Berlin raging the last two weeks in 1945. And it's dangerous, this thing is here to stop bits of stucco um, so these, built, these, these bullet holes come from the Battle of Berlin in 1945 and they're still here today because no one's got round to renovating the building. Regina Jonas um, was, um, she studied at the, another product of um, Enlightenment um, Judaism within Berlin. It was founded here, it was the center of, of uh, Jewish academic studies. Um, she wasn't the first woman to do that, but she did take it a step further. Um, there were three others who managed to uh, graduate, if you like, and were, were given sort of um, respect as religious teachers. Um, but in uh, um, early 1940-41, um, she applied for and was eventually ordained in Osnabrück. Um, she refuses to leave, she was deported. She went to Terezin, where she was then deported in 1944, together with the Licht family, for example, to Auschwitz, and um, was murdered. Um, in Terezin, nobody mentions uh, um, her presence, the female rabbi, uh, and she was again, like Otto Weit, rediscovered by academics after the war, but she lived in the house just down there. This house is completely gone. This is a um, 
90s memorial called The Missing House by a guy called Christian Boltanski, um, who was an artist in residence uh, in Berlin. He saw the house and he decided to try and find, you might be able to see, the names of the people that lived on each of the apartments on either side of the staircase. The house was bombed, but it gives you an idea of this community. Did they talk to each other? How well did they know each other? What did one neighbour think when their Jewish neighbour was deported? Um, did they know? What did they say afterwards? What did they feel for the rest of their lives? Really very uh, uh, vivid and so simple. You just give the name and the profession of the people that lived in the house. Moses Mendelssohn came um, as a teenager with his rabbi from Dessau um, in the early 1700s and he came just at the right time, the last of our four leaders, the peak of the Enlightenment with the Enlightenment King, King Frederick the Great. King Frederick the Great is on record as, um, as most Prussian monarchs as um, essentially um, anti-Semitic, um, but um, he thinks in fairness with his Enlightenment views um, um, a Jewish Prussian should be treated on the same level as people, uh, as Christians, uh, are under the law, which is a step forward. Mendelssohn, as we'll hear in a minute, made um, huge contributions to a debate um, on the place of Berliner and German Jews within Germany um, with his philosophical treaties and writings. Um, but after he died, his mantle was taken up by uh, a man called David Freelander. Um, yes, um, they were bullet holes. Every time you see what looks like a bullet hole in these buildings, that's what it is. David Freelander in 1778 would continue Mendelssohn's work, and this is the Jewish boys' school. Um, so when it first opened, um, it had a, a narrow range of specifically Jewish subjects, but it was important because it taught other things in mathematics and geography and uh, various other secular subjects, if you like, um, at, which, as it does today, um, it is a gymnasium, it's an academic school, uh, and uh, um, it still stands one of um, three places. This, the building next door, was the old people's home, now gone, and then is the cemetery, desecrated, and the old people's home became the deportation centre for the Jewish community, rounded up and collected from 1941 uh, in October um, from this area. So Moses Mendelssohn is um, an interesting guy. He comes here um, and um, starts work at the silk factory, but he's a very clever boy and he starts to study independently. He learns Latin and Greek, French, German. Uh, and starts reading and absorbing the great philosophical debates of the day. Uh, he becomes friend with, friends with the famous writer Lessing, who he'd visit. Uh, they, were, they were almost neighbours, um, and uh, he was familiar um, with the great philosopher um, from East Prussia, Immanuel Kant. Um, to cut a long story short, um, his basic uh, premise was that, rather like Luther, um, the individual can um, create their own relationship with God, um, that being Jewish doesn't preclude you from being German, um, because that was essentially a private religious matter, and that he's challenged on that, and it begins a debate about whether or not, um, about whether or not um, um, this was possible, um, which of course um, goes both ways. Um, Moses Mendelssohn um, would be uh, the man who would um, contribute to the beginning of a movement uh, that would produce people who felt that they could be uh, German um, and that their language was German um, and that um, being Jewish and German were, was, and it, as of course it is, uh, compatible. Um, so when the Zionist movement begins in the middle of the 1800s, so about a generation after Moses Mendelssohn died, um, many anti-Zionists said, no, this is our land. Why do we need to go back in time, you know, and become peasants again, um, irrespective of where this destination might be? This is our country and our language is German. Um, this is a, an East German memorial that was repositioned here, and it says on this place it was the old people's home of the Jewish community in Berlin. In 1942, it was changed by the Gestapo into a collection point for Jewish citizens. 55,600 or 55,000 Berliner Jews from infants to pensioners were dragged to uh, or bestially dragged to the concentration camps of Auschwitz and Theresienstadt and uh, are murdered. Never forget, guard against war and, pro and protect peace. And here was a memorial originally, destination, uh, originally destined for a concentration camp for women. It ended up here and behind. You can see the empty graveyard desecrated by the Gestapo. Moses Mendelssohn's grave originally was round the corner to the right. So now a protected area 
the first of the Jewish communities. So from the 1680s, they could bury here. And this is where they would build their first houses. Now we're going to go up and try and pull the story together. Um, you appreciate it's a very big, wide, detailed story, so I'll try to kind of synthesize the main points for you. Um, subscribe to the channel because we can do more of these if you uh, just ask um, the specific uh, um, uh, details. Then you won't miss uh, um, any of the uh, um, alerts. So give us a like and subscribe. We're going to go up now and uh, finish the, the tour by the uh, Reform Synagogue. So by the middle of the uh, late 1800s, this movement of uh, the development of German Jewry had changed um, religious practices and home life uh, enormously. And if you look at, for example, the number of people in mixed marriages, um, which horrendously, of course, comes to the fore when the Nazis start to categorize people, you realize that it had been achieved that being by religion Jewish um, did not preclude you from marrying non-Jews uh, if that was the path that you chose to take. But of course, the roof caves in as after um, fighting and dying against Napoleon in the Wars of Liberation and fighting on behalf of their uh, a pr a pride in their um, state, Prussia, um, in the wars of the 1860s and 70s, and 12,000 German Jews dying in the trenches of World War I, over 100,000 Jews volunteering and serving um, in that effort, finally achieving full emancipation and playing roles at the highest offices in the land, the roof, of course, caves in as the Nazi regime come to power. Um, by the 1st of April 1933, the Nazis had boycotted Jewish businesses for a day. Um, by 1935, you get the infamous Nuremberg Laws cobbled together for one of the Nuremberg rallies, which is a very peculiar mix of um, social and uh, financial restriction. Um, as well as these peculiar references to uh, blood and honour. And by 1935, um, some Jews were thinking, that this doesn't look like it's going to blow over, it might be time to leave. But the poor, um, those with dependents, people who'd been here for centuries, people who'd built up clientels and had no desire to begin again, why should they go when they are German? The uh, exodus initially is slow until there's a huge rush, not just a rush to leave, but a massive rush of hundreds of suicides after the night of violence known originally as Crystal Night. And up here is a synagogue appearing in the setting sun. And we see the Berlin as a play. Seeing on, used to be a palace here, the Montbeau Park. Just sitting around drinking a beer in Berlin. In 1938, there was an event in, uh, starting in March of 1938, for the full context. And that was, in 1938, the Nazis had absorbed Austria into the kingdom. And a lot of Austrian Jews were trying to get out of the country. Many of them were originally Polish. And as they flooded back to try and reclaim their Polish citizenship, Poland made them stateless. In October of 1938, Polish and foreign Jews within Germany were forcibly taken to the border, and one of those was the Greenspan family. Greenspan, um, the youngest, 17-year-old Herschel, was in Paris. But of course, Poland had already made them stateless, so they were thrown out of Germany, weren't allowed into Poland, and these families were then stuck in terrible conditions on the border uh, for months, and as they communicated with Herschel, he was outraged. So he runs to the German embassy in Paris and made an appointment to see the ambassador. He doesn't get to see him, he gets to see a lowly councillor called von Rath, who he then shoots several times in the stomach. Now you have to imagine that this synagogue here would be burned two nights later, but it's worth bearing in mind the synagogue in Munich had already been destroyed. The synagogue in, in Nuremberg had been destroyed. Um, so this is not, this is uh, um, 
this is part of a, a, a longer ongoing process. But on the 9th of November, at about four o'clock in the afternoon, von Rath died in hospital. Now, that was a very important day for the Nazi Canada because the 9th of November, every year, Adolf Hitler would be in Munich with his um, old fighters commemorating the attempt to seize power in 1923. So, he's there. Hitler has a whispered conversation with Goebbels, the propagandist, then leaves and comes back to Berlin. Uh, and then Goebbels goes on the radio and makes a speech where he implies that there might be a spontaneous uprising that night. Uh, and on the nights before, with von Rath still alive, there'd been attacks, people had been murdered. But there's a huge upsurge of violence where Germany finally shows its population, Europe and the world, that is a country, and it had been this for years that had no longer had the rule of law. The rule of law is what stands between civilized countries and barbarity, and the Nazis had already eroded that for certain groups without even changing the law. You just make it about racial grouping. That the law is about the gut feeling of the people's community. So if you don't belong to that community and you're disenfranchised, you're now outside the law. But it becomes clear to the population as um, over 5,000 buildings are burned, people are beaten to death on the streets, apartments are robbed, the fire brigade and the police stand outside to stop people putting the fires out. And the next day, and the lists had already been prepared, they were just waiting for an excuse. About 30,000 wealthy male Jews were taken to concentration camps to then be told, we've just spent the last five years encouraging you to leave the country and you're still here. So, maybe now you'll apply and pay your uh, a pitiful, uh, your massive taxes and uh, get a pitiful, pitiful price for your uh, um, business. It's usually about 10% of what it was worth and leave the country. And all of that would become known as Crystal Night. That's where there's a huge change, 9th of November 1938. So by the beginning of the next year, decisions are made by Hermann Goering under the orders of Hitler to try and find somebody who can come up with ideas of forcibly taking Jewish citizens of uh, Berlin and Germany elsewhere. And as the war begins, as we know, that then crystallizes into the horrors of the, uh, um, and tragedy of the Holocaust itself. So, Crystal Night, the end of the lawlessness, the barefaced lawlessness becomes the beginning of a set of uh, policies. Um, dealing with mistakes, dealing with issues uh, of the war, and then crystallize into the horrors of Auschwitz, Sobibor, Treblinka, Belzec, and Kelmno, uh, leaving Berlin um, burned out by today in 1945. This synagogue was actually saved for Crystal Night by the Berlin Fire Brigade, a man called Wilhelm Krutzfeld who convinces the uh, um, Nazi thugs to, or the fire brigade, to be allowed to put the fire out. And um, the building was eventually bombed in 1943. It was used as a clothing store. During the East German years, there was a small community that was centered around the Rukerstrasse synagogue up in Prenzlauer Berg. Um, West Berlin, of course, would be um, attractive um, for Jews, for example, trying to leave the Soviet Union would come through West Berlin and head towards Israel. But the moment the wall fell and the community were reunited, um, Berlin now has again a vibrant, flourishing new Jewish community and um, many from uh, Israel, many of our colleagues, guides as well. Um, and with that new beginning um, comes not just the positives, but the negatives. And I'll give you an example. This building was rebuilt. It's now a museum. It's got a place of worship on the top floor. Um, and it's a museum to the community that was here and the characters that live within it. Um, Einstein played the violin in here in January 1930. When it opened in 1866, it's a Moorish style. New York City dwellers might know the one on uh, Lexington Avenue, similar style. Um, you also got this Spanish, North African style in um, Prague as well. Um, Bismarck came to the opening of this in 1866. But you might be able to see there is a barrier and there is a police person there. So tragically, of course, these places become targets, places of historic uh, Jewish story for contemporary uh, world issues. Um, so the dangers and uh, the um, warnings um, still needed uh, to be heeded. But 
Berlin now is one, the community move forward, not here, they're scattered all over the city. Most active synagogue, I suspect, is um, on the western side of the city. But this synagogue um, symbolizes the beginning of the end, emancipation and a German Jewish community of acceptance that play a role in the, at every level of German society, in the destruction and horrors of the war, the pause of the fall of the wall, and the birth of the 21st century community today with that caveat that it's got a barrier and 24-hour police, sadly. But we've come to the end. Um, if you liked it, uh, like and subscribe. Um, if you like this tour, um, please feel free to donate the uh, uh, PayPal me at virtualberlintours.com. Um, the link is in the uh, um, uh, in the description as well. I think as well. You got any final questions? I'll leave you for with a few minutes of uh, a view of the synagogue as the sun goes down uh, on this uh, on this Sunday. Thank you, Diana. If you enjoyed the tour. PayPal me at Virtual Berlin Tours, I'd much appreciate that. You got other um, requests for, uh, um, for tours, just let me know. Thank you, Bar, it was great to uh, see you again and uh, share another part of Berlin's story with you. So I wish you all the best and uh, stay safe and let's meet in Berlin and do another tour soon. Thank you, Diana. You can also donate through uh, Sanam's Live as well. Thank you, Jill. It's been great to, um, to share this time with you. I'll see you next time, uh, Laura from Indonesia as well. It looks great. Take care, folks. I'll see you soon.
Thank you for your comments, everybody. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, if you made a donation, thank you also very, very much. I look forward to seeing you next time.